All right, in this video, we're going to take a look at the calculations that accompany our lab, the kinetics of the breathalyzer reaction. Uh, we were studying this equation. We had the skeleton equation given to us in the lab handout, and then we balanced it in acid solution, a redox uh, reaction. Dichromate, orange colored. This was the orange solution that we had at our benches. Um, we added alcohol, ethanol, to that and there was hydrochloric acid dissolved as well. This solution, as soon as the alcohol was added to the um, dichromate, this reaction began, and we were interested in studying the kinetics of this. So if we think of the differential rate law, the rate for this would equal a rate constant times the concentration of dichromate to some order x, the di concentration of alcohol to some order y, and the concentration of acid to some order z. Now that's a pretty complicated looking rate law. Um, to simplify things so that we could actually study this using an integrated rate law method, we flooded the reaction system. The, co the concentration of the dichromate in the original solution was very, very small. It was 0.0037 molarity. And then in that, there was also 3.6 molarity hydrogen ions from the hydrochloric acid. And then we added pure alcohol. So we added 3 milliliters to 200 milliliters of dichromate. So we had a very, very large, we'll just write large concentration of alcohol as well. Because the alcohol concentration and the acid concentration are much larger than the dichromate concentration, we can assume that these two concentrations stay constant during the reaction. They don't change very much. If they don't change very much, we can combine these concentrations with their orders into the rate constant, and we get a simplified rate law, the pseudo, first or, pseudo rather, uh, rate law, K pseudo times dichromate concentration to the power of x, where the K pseudo, the new rate constant, the pseudo rate constant, is actually equal to the old rate constant times the ethanol concentration to the power of y and the acid concentration to the power of Z. In our experiment, we're not really going to be finding the orders for the acid or the alcohol, and we're not going to find the actual rate constant. Instead, we're going to find the order for dichromate, and we'll find the value of the pseudo rate constant under these conditions. So what we'll do is we, we took the, uh, we started timing the reaction as soon as we added the alcohol to the dichromate. So we could say, the initially, if we think of a time and concentration of dichromate, we can set up a little table like this, time in minutes and concentration in molarity. At zero minutes, when we first added the alcohol, we added 3 milliliters of this to 200 milliliters of this, Technically, there's a small dilution there, but it's such a small dilution, we'll ignore it. We'll say that the dichromate starts off at a concentration of 0 0.0037 molarity. And now each group decided to measure the concentration by titration at different time intervals. So the time intervals are going to be different for each group. But suppose some, a certain group decided to do it at 8 minutes, at 16 minutes, at 24 minutes, etc. You probably had at least five data points. Five uh, after the zero type, uh, zero point, you had five other points as well. So what we need to do is calculate the concentration of dichromate at each of these time intervals. To do that, what it was kind of complicated. What we did was we withdrew a 10 milliliter. And that's going to be important to remember. 10, mil to 10 milliliter volume of the reaction mixture. We withdrew that, and we added immediately to that 4 milliliters of a 3% Ki solution, potassium iodide. 
that led to this redox reaction. The dichromate that was still in the 10 milliliter volume at that time reacted with the iodide ions from the Ki solution, and it formed iodine, which was a red colored compound in, in solution. So we immediately saw a red color appear, and then the dichromate was converted to chromium 3 plus. That was in an acid solution, and it was very fast, that reaction. In fact, it was instantaneous, essentially. So all of the orange-colored dichromate was converted to chromium-3. And the chromium-3 is technically a pale green color, but we couldn't see that because it was masked by the red iodine. The point is, though, that in this reaction, which is unbalanced, so be sure you balance this reaction in acid solution, you're going to need this ratio of dichromate to iodide. The point is that all of the dichromate remaining in the flask was instantly converted to chromium-3. So there was no more dichromate at, at, that, at that moment. At that point, we then took the flask and we um, titrated it. We started adding sodium thiosulfate, which contains S2O3, the thiosulfate ion, and we titrated that with the iodine that was produced in that reaction. That titration um, consumed the iodine, so the red color faded. The iodine was converted back to iodide, and the thiosulfate was converted to a product which we're not really that interested in. Um, to see the end point of that titration, we added a little bit of starch when we approached the end point. The starch combined with the remaining iodine, making a blue-black complex, and then we continued titrating until that blue-black complex was gone. At that point, the iodide is colorless, the S406 is colorless, the only thing left in the flask at that point was chromium-3, which gave it a pale green color. So the point is we measured the initial and the final volume of the thiosulfate used. So we know the volume of thiosulfate used. And we know that it was 0 0.010 molarity. 0 0.010 molarity. Now look at what we're going to do. You're going to have to balance both of these reactions. These are not balanced reactions. They're redox reactions that have to be balanced in acid solution. You're going to need a couple of ratios. We're going to need the ratio of thiosulfate to iodine, and we're going to need the ratio of iodine, I think I misspoke earlier, iodine to dichromate. This ratio in the second equation and iodine to dichromate in the first equation. So if you take your volume of thiosulfate used, let's say milliliters of thiosulfate, you'll simply set up a string of unit multipliers to calculate the concentration, the molarity, of dichromate that was in the solution at that time. So what we'll do is we'll convert that to liters, then you'll convert from liters to moles because we know the molarity of the thiosulfate solution. Now that you know the moles of thiosulfate, you can find moles of iodine from your balanced equation. Moles of iodine, you can then say how many moles of dichromate were in there from the ratio in the first equation. Once you know the moles of dichromate, you know that there was a 10 milliliter volume so if you divide the moles by 10 milliliters converted to liters, you'll know the molarity of dichromate at that time. So you'll know the molarity of dichromate at 8 minutes, the molarity of dichromate at 16 minutes, at 24 minutes, etc. Once you have those concentrations calculated, you can then do your graphing, the kinetics graphing. You'll make three graphs, and I'll want these printed from your computer, from Microsoft Excel. So you'll make a graph of concentration of dichromate versus time, natural log of concentration versus time, and the reciprocal of concentration <coughs> excuse me, versus time. You'll do linear regression on each of the three graphs, 
and we'll choose the graph which is most linear, we'll want to know the slope of that linear line to calculate the pseudo rate constant. So I hope that helps with your calculations. Talk with your lab partner. Each person should do the calculations for themselves.